All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and or good afternoon, uh, and, and welcome to another in the series of uh, Tigera CTO uh, talks uh, or webinars. Uh, my name is Christopher Williams, Sophie. For those of you who, who haven't joined before, uh, I am the CTO for Solutions here at Tigera and one of the co-founders. So. Um, what we thought we'd do today was, again, uh, we've been getting some questions about uh, uh, getting some questions and suggestions of, of things people want to hear about. So instead of me coming up with interesting topics or maybe not so interesting topics to talk about, we figured we'd answer some of those. And, and we got a couple of questions uh, in the past uh, about if we could actually, you know, all this Calico and policy and, and networking is great, but what's the actual use case? What are people actually using this for? So I thought today we'd go over a little bit of a couple of use cases that we've actually seen in the wild. Uh, these are either specific users or uh, that I'm, I'm anonymized, obviously, or it's a sort of composite of, of a, a theme that we see, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, some of those. So as we're going, uh, Mike is, uh, our, our MC is, is not here. He's out sick today. So it's going to be me talking and, uh, and watching uh, for questions, et cetera. So if you go ahead and have questions, just uh, raise it as a, as a chat or raise your hand and uh, I'll try and catch that and, uh, and respond. So, um, and we'll make the videos for this available uh, probably a day or so after the after the the webinar. So again, what we're going to talk about today is a couple of use cases, um, and we'll get started. I'll explain what what the three use cases I picked were, um, and if anyone wants to um, ask questions about those even before we get started, uh, more than happy to. Uh, so one is integration of, of native hosts uh, into an infrastructure and, and how do you get a, a, a security environment, how do you revise the security environment that's protecting your native hosts to work in an environment where you're going to be using uh, containers as well as, as native hosts uh, to deliver your application. So we'll talk about that. Um, what a couple of users have seen, why they went down the Calico path, and uh, some of the benefits. Uh, the second is, is public-private. So we have a number of folks who you know, maybe start off in private cloud uh, and now want to also take make use of public cloud providers. And I'll give you one example that we've been working with, uh, what their architecture is, is gonna look like um, and what they're already uh, testing. So I'll, I'll go into that as, as sort of an interesting architecture. And the third is policy enforced multi-tenancy or, or policy enforced uh, controls at, at diff from different layers of the organization. And in the case I'm going to talk about, it's, it's specifically customers um, and then the infrastructure provider, um, but it could, could as easily be different groups within an, within an organization. Um, and, and folks who need different security levels, um, i.e. different groups have different rights to enforce uh, security policy. So those will be the three that we'll, we'll go over today. Um, and if we don't have any other questions about that or suggestions for other use cases to talk about, I'll go ahead and get started with the bare metal integration. So, You notice I always go to the whiteboard. Uh, it's my habit. I apologize. So in this case, the um, user had a large number of bare metal hosts, and those bare metal hosts um, were basically statically addressed uh, into IP address ranges, and uh, they needed to apply security policy across those hosts. So basically an architecture with you know, a large number of hosts
maybe red hosts, blue hosts, short one color. And green hosts. And those might be distributed across the infrastructure, but they're all in address ranges. Can't really see that's green. Um, this is green, that's red. Okay. Uh, color is a little bit off on the camera. Yeah, you know, and then they had some number of switches and routers that have filters. And those filters might say, you know, all of those might have rules that say red can talk to green. So all of these have the red address ranges can talk to the green address ranges. And the uh, blues can talk to reds. So those rules are on all the switches because you don't know where the individual nodes are, are going to get stood up, configured. And then you know, some of these hosts are connected to these switches. And there was some kind of network between them. And that was the way their infrastructure was, was built. That's why a lot of people built their infrastructures. You know, these could be VLANs, reds, greens, blues, we put in VLANs. In this case, they used, um, you know, and, and then have subnets. These VLANs might be virtualized and, and tunneled over some kind of SDN, or they might just be configured on the switches. But nonetheless, blues were in one or more address ranges, reds were in one or more address ranges, and greens were in one or more address ranges. That's great if the simple rules are blues only can talk to reds. But what if all of a sudden some number of blues also need to talk to greens. So there's some subset of blues that also need to talk to green. Well, then we can't have these kind of rules. These blues now need to be further subdivided into blues that can talk to green and blues that can talk to reds. It's another address set of address ranges. Put those rules in. And these rules start getting fairly chunky. So in this case, we were talking thousands and thousands and thousands and more thousands of hosts with lots of different rules. So what you were looking at was literally tens of thousands of filter rules in the infrastructure. Those had to be maintained everywhere. Um, their IP address ranges, they're not provisioned by whatever's putting applications on here. So a couple of things happen. One, Keeping these up to date is difficult, and removing the cruft, removing the rules that you no longer need, are also very difficult. But the bigger issue is TCAM space. Uh, for those of you who are networking guys or gals, um, there's an issue where a filter rule, if you want to run at wire rate on a switch or a router, has to be installed in hardware memory. It's called usually TCAM. Routers and switches have limited amounts of TCAM. More TCAM make is much more expensive and it's not a linear, it actually gets super linear. So they were at the point where their switches and routers could not actually handle any more rules. They could put no more business logic into their infrastructure. It meant that they'd have to slow down deployments, new customer acquisition, et cetera, a bit, bit of a problem. The other thing, that was they were looking at was at some point, some of these workloads might migrate to containers and or VMs, but, but containers were definitely a target. 
And as you know, if you've been uh, listening to to our talks or, or watching things like Kubernetes, et cetera, containers are ephemeral. And one of the things is the IP addresses associated with containers are also ephemeral. So all of a sudden these rules now not only are capping out their growth, but if a container, now a blue container, spins up, it also needs to talk to red, his IP address is not going to be fixed in time or space. It's literally an ephemeral address that the infrastructure assigns it, which means that his address, we would call blue prime, must be programmed in to the switches at time of pod creation, all the switches. Remember we said we can't put rules in here anymore. Say we could. I have to program these switches to make this behave like the original infrastructure. And if this thing's only going to last a couple of seconds, you probably won't be done, even if you automated the heck out of this, you probably won't be done programming the switches before the uh, container itself, the pod itself, uh, goes away. So we've got a... a now not only a, a resource contention problem in the switch, we also have an impedance mismatch um, where the time to live of these pods is shorter than the time it takes to update the switches about the existence of the pods. So this is what they were looking at and saying that this was not a tenable solution. Now, you know, they were already sort of stuck um, and they would become uh, basically completely stuck by the time they started going to a more dynamic uh, application environment. So what, what to do? So we still have red, but let's now just think about what to do before we introduce containers or pods. Let's just talk about how you fix this, but in a manner that, that's A, more efficient, doesn't introduce resource constraints, and most importantly, sets you up for containers or pods or VMs as, as you go forward, in this case, containers and Kubernetes, and I just stepped on the power switch for a light. Um, so, what to do? One of the things that you can do with Calico is you can install Calico on a native host a native Linux host. We talked about this a couple of webinars back. So they install Calico on each of these hosts. And as a quick recap, for those of you who may not be aware of how Calico does policy, uh, Calico does policy by labels. So you might label these as blue hosts or blue endpoints, these as red endpoints, and these as green endpoints. And that's also a blue endpoint. And you might have a policy then that says blue endpoints can talk to red endpoint, uh, to red endpoints, and red endpoints can talk to green endpoints. Um, that might be indeed a, a very simple policy to reflect what's here. So what they did was install Calico on all of these nodes. They then wrote exactly those policies that I just mentioned. Blue can talk, things labeled blue, well, so they installed it and then they attached labels in Calico to each of these nodes. And that's a, that's a process that's automated via an API and it can be done at, at node creation time via say an integration with Terraform or Chef or Puppet when you deploy applications, or it can be done later by a, a call in the Calico API. Basically says, these things are blues, these things are reds, and these things are greens, and here are my policies. Blue can talk to red, red can talk to green. So they did that across a huge number of hosts. Once they did that, the policies now are rendered right here. So this is a blue node. So it would have a policy rendered on it 
that says I can talk to red because it knows it's blue. Because it's blue, it doesn't need to talk to green. So we only install the blue needs to talk to red policies. This is something Calico automates. So now these policies can come off the switch. Similarly, these red nodes know that they can talk These red nodes know that they can receive traffic from blue. And that they can send traffic. So that what I did here to say no, send traffic to blue nodes. And it will also know that it can receive traffic, excuse me, receive traffic from blue nodes. allowed in, and we're allowed to send traffic to green nodes. So that's what these rules are installed here. Blue allow is allowed in, and this might be further defined to say what ports blue is allowed to talk to, etc. And now the greens have a policy that says they're allowed to receive traffic from red, again, maybe on a specific port or set of ports. So there's a couple of interesting effects here. One, and this policy goes away. Each node only gets configured, and this is dynamic, it happens in real time as you change your policies, but each node is only configured with the policies that affect that node. So, this thing knows nothing about the blue green inter about the uh, green red interaction because it doesn't do green. Uh, this should have been red in, sorry. Ins and outs, not enough coffee this morning. And so it doesn't need to know about the red green interaction because it's not green and it's not red. So policies are now rendered locally and only the ones that are necessary. We no longer have policies in the switches. So we are no longer resource constrained by the switches. You can have other very gross policies in here, very coarse policies if you wanted, but these don't have to be operational policies. Also, because the policies are rendered right on the hosts, uh, we know very specifically this is a blue host. We don't have to look up an IP address. We know it's blue because it's on a blue host. So the policies are actually rendered in a place where we can authoritatively say this is blue or this is red or this is green. So there's an interesting solution. The other thing is the policies are now fairly generic. Reds can talk to greens. Um, blues can talk to greens. Uh, blues can talk to greens and um, and blues can talk to red, excuse me, blues can talk to red, reds can talk to green. So I've got two policies that are stored. They're only rendered in the network when a host comes up and is identified as a blue, red, or green host. So we don't have firewall craft. We don't have rules in here in these switches that might be five years old and no one knows if they're still necessary or not. I also don't need to keep track of IP addresses because what these actual rules in here were lists of IP addresses. So somebody maintain a list of all the blue hosts IP addresses and enumerate those IP addresses in this filter. So once you've done that, you see an IP address here. You don't know it was a blue host or a red host or a green host. You can only infer that based on the rule it's attached to. It makes it very hard to clean up rules later. It makes it very easy to make mistakes. Here, this is all pushed to the edge. So all the policy treatments pushed to the edge and the infrastructure becomes very simple. So this was their entry point. It's not the standard entry point because Calico, but it was an interesting entry point. But now, because this is the, the way that they've structured, as 
because they are moving to Kubernetes, they now have nodes out here that might have blue pods and green pods. There is no difference between these and those. There is a slight difference the way Calico looks at it, uh, but it's an esoterica uh, regarding how the pol where the policies get applied, uh, but basically it's the same. So in this case, now on here, I have a policy that says that this pod is allowed to source traffic to red. This green pod is allowed to receive traffic from red. And um, blue is allowed to send traffic. Again, I'm in all my colors. And, and blue is allowed green, blue, that's it, because I don't have a red. That's it. So now that node that's hosting two Kubernetes pods gets the same rules that you would have gotten here. Got this rule because it's blue, and it got this rule because it's green. Those are only aimed at those pods. So now their policy infrastructure, the way they program their policy, doesn't change if they're going from pods to containers, I mean hosts to containers, or keep a mix of both, which in this case is what they're going to be doing. This all is the same mechanics everywhere. And it, the big-ish thing is policies are now ensconced as something that's, that's human readable and, and understandable. Uh, it's application-centric rather than network-centric. And it scales with the size of the nodes. Since the rendering of the policy goes with the nodes. The more nodes I add, I add more scale to the infrastructure versus the more nodes I add having to scale the, the core switching infrastructure, uh, which at some point you will actually run into limitations of physics, i.e. there's no more room for that number of gates on the switch. Does this all make sense? Anyone have any questions about this use case before I go on? Come on, someone's got to have a question. Okay. Well then, why don't we go ahead and do the next use case, which is public private. And this is sort of a hybridization of uh, a couple of different things we've seen, but let's talk about that as well. The use case I'm not talking about, obviously, is the classical standard Kubernetes network policy use case or network connectivity and policy use case. Um, there's a huge number of, of examples of that. These, I think, are all more interesting, show you maybe some more of the flexibility you have in an environment like, like Calico. So, and any question, one last question for questions before I erase this. It's easier to, to do this when I, before I erase it. Okay, done. Now the next use case, pardon me a second, is public hybrid, public private hybrid. So in this case, um, I'll take the normalized uh, example here. It's a couple different, uh, multiple different users using this, but let's just take the user as an example, or the fabric owner. So they have a private data center here. So this is a private PC. And there's a Kubernetes cluster in it. So in the Kubernetes cluster, I'm just going to draw
you would never build it this thin. One spine switch, two leaf switches, some number of hosts. They're running Kubernetes. And they have their policies in here. So they've got their red, blue, and green pods running in here. And they have, let's just say, some of the same, the same policies we said earlier. This, it's not, yeah. That's not as an interesting conversation, again, about policies. It's more of a what they're doing. Okay, so we've got some number of pods, red, blue, green pods, and they're in this private data center. Kubernetes is running. This is all great. And Calico is handling the networking as not this policy is also handling the networking to their top of rack switch, which is going out to the corporate network the rest of the infrastructure. So we're doing routing, there's no overlays here, this just works, this is great because Calico is an IP networking uh, environment. It can interact natively with these switches and announce routes so that you can get from pod to pod or from the corporate network to the individual pods or to services that all just basically works in Calico. Uh, and you, we can uh, we're going to talk a little more about BGP in a future uh, webinar, and that's the technology we're using, for example, here to talk to the top of rack switches and the spine switch. Uh, but this is basic, basic networking for your networking uh, staff. So now they've decided they want to try uh, some public cloud as well. They, they uh, decided that it's maybe more cost effective instead of building a whole other data center to just rent the resources they need as they need them in a public cloud infrastructure. So let's go ahead and say on the other end of this is the public world. So here's a public cloud. So I'm going to use Amazon terminology here as a uh, as an example, same basic capabilities exist in all the public clouds, uh, Google, Bluemix, Azure, others, Packet. Uh, Packet's a little different because it more replicates a private cloud environment as far as you get actual bare metal servers, but they all pretty much have uh, similar capabilities here, digital, uh, digital ocean. So anyway, how what the organization wants, so let's go ahead and draw a Amazon. So let's draw over here, we've got a VPC. And within this VPC is a Kubernetes cluster again. So again, there's really no networking in here. It's it, networking just works in the VPC. So you've got some number of instances and those instances are have red and blue and green containers in them. I should just get a, I wonder if I make a whiteboard stamp where I could just get a stamp and stamp this up uh, automatically. So I've got these containers over here as well. But not all that useful unless I can connect the two together. So you could just do a VPN between the two. But let's say you now decide you want to do a VPC in another region. So you now have uh, one in Europe, one in the US, or one in Asia, and one in the US West. You end up having to run traffic, build a full mesh of VPNs between these. And, and that may not be particularly useful if you've got multiple data centers and multiple regions, you end up with a full complete mesh. So you can use something called a transit VPC, for example. 
And Transit VPC is basically a routing core for your public cloud. And the Transit VPC has a couple of routers in it. And you have a couple of different options, so a multitude of options. There are some that you can buy, open source that you can use, but there's some routers in there. So what this customer has done is they now have a router in the data center that that spine connects to. And that router uses something in Amazon terms is a direct connect. You could also use a VPN over the public internet, but they wanted a higher throughput, tens of gigs. So they put in a direct connect, which is basically a fiber from their site into, um, in this case, Amazon. So that VPN, that direct connect, ends up connecting to those two routers. You then stand up a router in this VPC, just another instance. It could be the same router you're using here, it could be something else. And that router is talking to those two routers in the transit VPC. If you end up with another region VPC, I'm not going to draw everything out here. VPC in another region, surprise, surprise, it gets a router, and that router is connected to the transit VPC. Move my laptop a little bit out of the way. Let's see. I won't draw the instances down here, but it's basically the same architecture. Because Calico can talk to routers natively and without NCAP, these Calico nodes will talk to this router if they need to get out of the VPC. If they don't need to get out of the VPC, they can talk directly to each other and not burden the router. That's standard IP routing capability as long as you set it up right. So now all of a sudden, pods here, once these routes for these pods are announced into the transit VPC routers, those are announced to this router, which distributes them in the private cloud. So now, Private cloud nodes know about nodes in the different VPCs, and nodes in different VPCs know about each other as well. So now this all looks like one big networked fabric. And from a reachability standpoint, those pods can communicate with one another directly, provided policy allows that. The next hook on this is something I talked about two weeks ago, which is you can actually interconnect the Kubernetes and the Calico policy store among all of these endpoints. So now, if you have a policy that says blues, what is it, blues can talk to reds, you can have that policy store in one place. Blues are allowed to talk to reds. And this blue node this note here will know where all of the reds are in the infrastructure. It will know that there are reds here, here, and here, but we'll also know about these reds over here and these reds down here. So now that one policy can be applied everywhere. This red will know that the thing it's trying to connect to it is a blue. It's a blue in a different site, but it really doesn't care. So now you have a common policy very easy reachability. This is standard IP routing. If you can fix an IP routed network, you can fix this network. This, in fact, if you want to look at it, these VPC core routers almost, you know, they could be border routers in your data center. You can almost look, think of them as a spine 
and these as racks, just potentially very large racks of um, potentially thousands of hosts. But the, the architectural instance looks a little bit like this. So that's the second use case. So we think, you know, this is, we're seeing people starting to go down this road. You know, you might even have multiple private, public, private data centers also connected into this. I've even seen people talking about interconnecting their sites using transit VPCs. Um, you know, it's, if you're already investing in Direct Connect, maybe that's cheaper than having your own uh, IP VPN between your sites as well. Don't know. Um, it's an interesting bit of math to work. But this is the public-private hybrid use case that enables reachability across public and private cloud, as well as policy continuity between the public and private sides. Last questions, last uh, shot for questions, both for, I erase this one. Going, going, going. Okay. So the next one is multi-tenancy. And again, um, we have a number of people doing this slightly different ways, so I'm gonna turn this into um, an overall use case, one way of potentially solving it. And you know, there's other ways of solving it as well. So use case here is Kubernetes has landed in the organization. Uh, the particular use case I'm gonna talk about is actually, uh, they're looking at offering Kubernetes as a service. So instead of having one Kubernetes cluster among um, everyone, uh, every group gets their own Kubernetes cluster, but how do you manage that as an organization? All right, was the desire. So what you can do, one way of doing this, there's, I'll probably do two, uh, if we've got time, is set up an environment where you have let me do the simpler one let me easier so the simpler one you can have a Go with the single Kubernetes cluster, it'll be easier uh, to go with the time we have left. So I've got a Kubernetes cluster, but in this case, I have tenancy requirements. So again, I've got a Kubernetes cluster. And in it again, I'm not going to draw out the physical connectivity. I have some number of hosts. And now I have tenant organizations. So you might have a red, blue, and green tenant. So whenever red fires up a workload, it gets labeled as tenant red. So what you have here is tenant is red. Green workloads come up. And those are labeled tenant green. Blue workloads come up. And those are labeled tenant blue. 
Now the basic policy is going to be that tenants can't talk to other tenants directly. They can only talk to other tenants via externally exposed services. So tenant blue might offer a service, blue service, that is exposed using the services, external services as an external service for Kubernetes. So an ingress controller would route traffic to tenant blue and, and the policy on I do service blue and there will be a policy that allows anyone to send traffic to service blue. But anything else, all the internal pods, blue can only talk to blue, red can only talk to red, green can only talk to green. This starts looking a lot like um, what we've talked about before, except now the policies are, are even easier. The policy is red can talk to red, green can talk to green, and blue can talk to blue. You can also do this with namespaces, some other things we're going to do is a simple policy start as an example. So that's great, we have a policy. But within these organizations, they still want to use Kubernetes policy, network policy, Calico, because for example, maybe um, green X workloads should only be able to talk to green Y workloads and uh, blue A workloads should only be able to talk to blue B workloads, etc. So you might have, for example, a policy that then says A can talk to B and X can talk to Y. So there's a couple of ways this can be rendered in policy. You could actually have, using a higher priority, a policy that sets the tenant reachability. Red can talk to red, green can talk to green, blue can talk to blue. And you can say, and we'll talk about how you might enforce that later, and then a lower priority that would further set a is allowed to talk to B, or X is allowed to talk to Y. You could also do this by actually writing aggregate policies such that someone in blue can write a policy that says A can talk to B, but so the way that policy gets written is the label selector is a role a, and that allows 443 to things labeled role B. This policy down here. So if it's role, if something's role A, then we're going to allow uh, outbound to things labeled role B on 443. However, that doesn't enforce, oh, let's call this C, just so we don't confuse things. What you can do with Calico policy, though, is say, the selector is role A and tenant, B. And it's allowed to talk to things role B and tenant, role C and tenant B. So this is basically saying A's can talk to C's only if they are also both in tenant B. Either of these mechanisms you could enforce, say, in your CI CD chain. You know, the, someone who belongs to group B must have selectors that include tenant B in the policy, for example. 
there's other ways you can do this. Stay tuned. Um, there's some other things we're working on in this space that uh, make this even more flexible. But basically, you can now start applying policies to enforce multiple levels. Let's say in this case, a tenancy, and then still allowing finer grain policy within that tenancy. 